we on here? Oh, hi. Hello, everyone. How you doing? Um, so, uh, I thought I would start today with some questions that that many of us, as uh, as users of Type and, and enthusiasts of Type, have gotten many times over the years. Uh, it's, it's kind of a, a classic question that all of us need to uh, confront at one point or another. Why make more typefaces? Aren't there enough already? Um, I actually used to really resent this question. Uh, it's just, I just get annoyed by it. If someone's like, demanding for me to, to justify uh, why I do what I do and what I, what I care about. Um, and I thought it would need some really elaborate uh, philosophical uh, uh, explanation. But I came to realize that the answer for this question is actually really simple, because typefaces are solutions for things. And we need more typefaces because we keep having new problems. It's actually as simple as that. Those problems could be technological. Those, those they could be uh, stylistic. But this is really what this is about. New stuff keeps coming up, so we keep needing new things. That's that's how this works. And luckily, I love problems. Um, you know, there are all kinds of of you know, parts of your life that will make perfect sense in retrospect. And uh, you know. I used to love doing problems and putting together jigsaw puzzles and all those uh, uh, kinds of puzzles and challenges, and this is a, a terrific version of that. You know, I've come to realize that you know if, that if if you're the sort of person who loves problems, this is a good place for you to be. Uh, if you, you know, if you like Sudoku, you will love type design because that, that's what this sort of thing is about. And the the problem that I've been spending a lot of time uh, recently thinking about is text on the web and how that is uh, how that can be improved um, because uh, it's it's a tremendous part of how we all consume type in in just about any context and when we think about designing a website we may have this in mind when we're thinking about the palette and the structure and the system of everything that will happen, but what our audience will get is actually this. Uh, these letters, hopefully nice, nicely drawn letters, rendered as parts of pixels turned on. And different platforms and different rasterizers will do this in their own particular way, but this it's some version of this. So these shapes that I spent so much time drawing and and revising and revising again and again and again will turn into what I like to think of as fruit salad. Um, and depending on which monitor you're looking at, that fruit salad may have been left out on the counter for a couple of weeks. Um, but uh, it means that, that the, uh, the environment of the screen is not very... Uh, it's not very accommodating. It's not very cooperative for the kind of subtlety and detail that type needs to be made of. So if we look at something that does actually doesn't work very well on a screen, uh, something like Helvetica, uh, we can see the sort of things that uh, that can happen when this uh, what's called this subpixel rasterization happens. This sort of haze uh, when these letters turn into this this kind of haze. Um, Things like parallel lines, like a double L, will turn into something that is a bit, a bit vague, a bit smushy. Um, something like uh, the difference between a capital I and a lowercase I, which is actually a semantic difference in English, uh, can literally be just a couple of shades of, in this case, blue, uh, being separated from each other. And shapes uh, like this C in, in Helvetica, which has this very small aperture, uh, especially if it's spaced very closely next to something else, can smear together and turn into an O. Uh, and actually, I have a list of words back in the office where uh, a C turning into an O will actually turn into another word that that is actually a you know, a valid word in English. Um, and it could seem like this stuff is you know things are just unpleasant um, or uh, uh, irritating, but uh, 
we have the luxury of saying that you know if our if we are fluent in English and we can rely on our experience as readers to resolve any of this ambiguity, um, there are s uh, depending on which source you look at, there's something like 30 million people around the world who are working on learning some new language. Um, so this is actually not uh, an aesthetic issue. Uh, this is actually an accessibility issue. If you can't make your text clear, there's going to be some large number of people who are going to have trouble. They won't just be irritated. They will actually have trouble accessing this content. So if we look at the sorts of a design that works well um, uh, on screen, uh, there, there was design with the screen in mind like uh, like Verdana and one that was not, like Helvetica. Um, and uh, I beat up on Helvetica a lot, but to be fair, this was 1957. Web browsers were really not in the picture. So, um, but we see that there are some uh, uh, some consistent themes in between these two designs, particularly in the spacing, where you know, Helvetica really shines in the display sizes. It was never really meant for text, uh, and it was really it doesn't work so well there. It works even uh, less so on, on the web, where we need more space, uh, not just for the smaller size, but to make room for this sub-pixel haze. Um, the apertures, uh, you know, the openings at the, the C and the E and the S, uh, make for this really dramatic counterform. Again, looks great in a headline. It is deadly when you get to a text size. And Verdon makes a point of opening that up as much as possible. Um, uh, I can't. I was trying to figure out if it was Roger or David that refers to to all of this as the Verdana principle. I'm not sure where they got that name, um, perhaps from Verdana. I don't know. Um, there is another uh, sort of aspect to this uh, called hinting, which is this extra pile of engineering. It's, it amounts to essentially a, a, a sort of demolition and redesign of the entire design. Uh, to to make it uh, produce a, a more successful arrangement of pixels and subpixels on screen. Um, for those of you who are familiar with hinting, I can tell you that I'm not going any further than this one image um, into hinting. This is as far as I'm going. We're stopping here. Um, but w hinting will, uh, the purpose of hinting is really to clarify what is already there and clean up uh, things that haven't added up quite so well. So on the top line is something that has not been hinted, and below it is something that has. So the space uh, between the stroke and the dot of the I has been restored. Um, some weight has been dug out of the lowercase k, and the spacing has been worked out. But hinting can, won't turn Helvetica into Frutiger or something that would work better on screen. It's only going to, uh, it can only work with what already exists. So it's tempting to think that uh, the solutions that we need to find and, and implement are as, uh, you know, are, are new because these problems are, are new. But the, these issues have actually been around for quite a long time. And our predecessors in uh, the design business were dealing with something very similar about half a century ago with text on screen, except they were dealing with TV monitors rather than computer screens. And this was the state of screen typography in the mid-1960s. Um, feel pretty good about what we have now. Um, but in 1967, the news department at CBS was preparing for the 1968 presidential election. And they knew that in the course of this news cycle, they would have they would have a lot of text on screen. Uh, you know, polls were not the the sort of daily thing that we have now, um, but there would still be names of candidates um, and states and percentages and and so on. Uh, and even with this very small example, they were already having trouble. That that smudge of 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 whatever up in the top left corner is supposed to be M-I-N-N -N for Minnesota. Uh, and I assume that's Minneapolis or something below it, perhaps. I don't know. But clearly, there was a problem on their hands. Um, and 
uh, Rudy Bass with the engineering department at CBS News created a custom typeface to try to address this problem, to try to anticipate what uh, a broadcast signal and a cathode ray uh, uh, screen would do to letter forms. And they took their uh, uh, current uh, typeface of News Gothic Bold and made this new version of it, uh, which n uh, notably had these sort of bytes taken out of all of the corners to try to anticipate the light blooming that would happen on screen. They, they couldn't predict how much um, would happen because it was dependent on how good the reception that particular set had. If you think for a moment about like all of the stuff that you've got to put in, into your code to make uh, to make this browser display your type the way it should, and, and you got to do this other thing so that Chrome will, will do what you want it to do. That is nothing compared to the idea that your type is dependent on the rabbit ears on top of the TV set. Just appreciate that for a moment. Um, and this is the uh, sort of the before and after of News Gothic Bold and uh, what they called um, CBS News 36. And they managed to uh, actually improve this quite a bit. Uh, the, these little hole punch uh, uh, notches that they put into the uh, into the intersections actually did a good job of absorbing this uh, the blooming and keeping these these shapes crisp. Um, they opened up the spacing a little bit, but not as much as they should have. But in some s respects, they actually took a step backwards. Um, and you can see in the, the cap S there, because it's starting with News Gothic, has pretty open apertures. That actually worked well. Um, being in the mid-60s, they felt some obligation to nod to the, the international style that was really uh, popular at the time. So they gave everything all these really closed apertures. They actually made that kind of worse. Uh, they made the shape wider, so maybe that offset it. But so this was kind of a step forward and a step back. I, I was I still wonder what this would have been if they brought a type designer uh, you know, into the room to to help out with this. But it's it's uh, humbling to see that this uh, idea of trying to make stuff look good on screen predates all of us and any piece of machinery that we've ever worked with. So if you can hold that thought for a moment. Um, when we look at a, a type specimen these days, uh, and we see this, this sort of waterfall, uh, unless we're being told otherwise, we can assume that all of this, everything that we're seeing came from one file, uh, unless we're being told that there's a display and a text and whatever. Um, if you look at the equivalent waterfall from from years past, uh, back in the uh, uh, hot metal or, or cold, me cold metal handset days, you knew that each line of this specimen was a physically separate object with its own price. You can see over there all on the right, it's sort of their equivalent of a SKU number and a price for each one of these things because being handset type, these are physically distinct objects that, ha that had to be manufactured separately and displayed separately, sold separately, shipped separately, used, stored, maintained separately, and it was a tremendous pain. Um, and uh, within that, there was actually a great opportunity that was, sort of, I, I think, forgotten by many amidst all of the, the drudgery of having to make this stuff and store literally tons of metal. That being separate objects, uh, the design being carried by each one of these sizes could be modified separate from one another so that they could uh, be exactly the thing that our eye needs at that particular size because that what our eyes need is not linear. It does not scale in, in a uh, uh, dependable way from one size to the next. So if you look at the smallest sizes of, of metal type that were cut for that purpose, um, you'll see a, a distinct set of, uh, a very reliable set of trends, like shapes getting, the overall shapes getting wider, uh, often the uh, overall height of things, particularly X height, would get higher, space between shapes would get, uh, would get larger, and the smaller details like serifs and ball terminals would 
would get larger, and all kinds of uh, things, as well as the apertures, all kinds of things would uh, would change simultaneously. But if this was done properly and 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 carefully, uh, no one would really notice. It would all just feel like the same thing because each one of these aspects was changing just a little bit to add up to something much more potent. So, with that in mind. Now it's time for the crazy hypothesis, which is that screen text can actually be treated as if it were an optical size. The origin of these two problems of getting something to look good at five point or six point on paper and getting something to look good at uh, 12 pixels on screen are completely different in their origin, but what they call for is exactly the same. And I had suspected this for some time. Uh, after uh, working at, at, at the Font Bureau and seeing the system fonts for Apple and Microsoft being produced and working with Mike Parker and going through the archives at the plant in Moretus and the, and the Smithsonian uh, and, and St. Bride's, that there is a trend there that kept repeating over and over again. And I've had this idea in the back of my head for, for years that I've wanted to try out, which is to see if one could be treated as if it were the other. And with this latest release, uh, uh, late last year with Mallory uh, from, from the new Freya Jones Foundry, I finally got the chance to you know, put this into, into practice. So uh, once the, the, as it were, the normal version of the design was made, uh, I made a second version of the design that did all of these things that we were just looking at increased widths, uh, altered uh, uh, vertical relationships, particularly between the caps and the lowercase, increased spacing, uh, and especially the, uh, the apertures. And each one of these changes was actually pretty small, so as not to disturb the, you know, that flavor that I had spent months and months trying to refine and establish. But the idea was to... Uh, sort of leverage uh, you know, all of this experience uh, and uh, from the past and to make this something more effective uh, for the web so that uh, so that Mallory as it was released has the what you call sort of the normal we call the standard uh, part of the family has this conventional structure of Romans and italics and then this other thing that we call micro plus which is kind of an up an optical size, but it does this other thing because it was made for the web and for small size print at the same time. And uh, there are, you know, th there are types, there are typefaces that are geared for use uh, on the web, uh, and that's that's a, a good thing to to take on. But I thought I've come to think that if that's the only place that that can be used, that's not really giving the user the most for their money. It should be able to work in more than just one environment. Um, so that was, uh, I think, another, uh, uh, another reason that I really wanted to see if this could work, uh, not just the, the, the kind of weird bank shot through history to see if, if I could get these two things to coincide, but it was also to give the user something that they could do more than one thing with. So. Uh, so th that was released uh, late last um, late last year, and coming up next, which will be our our next release, um, Retina is a design from uh, from some time ago, which I made for the um, the stock listings of the Wall Street Journal, and it had this odd uh, sort of backstory in that it began with the, the with the tiny sizes in print. Uh, uh, end of the scale rather than you know headlines or text or something that would be more uh, more conventional but with this the so so with this the development has sort of been the reverse of of what it had been with Mallory where it began with this micro version that was originally for tiny print we've uh, pulled apart the family and put it back together again so that it can uh, work on on the web uh, and um, and succeed in the in the same in the same way that it did in in small print. So so this is the uh, so this is the the family that will 
that will be coming out in a few months. I'm being shown a very nice sign that says five minutes. It's a very nice looking five. Who drew that? Anyway. Um, so, uh, like I said at the start, I love problems. Um, and I like the, the challenge of, of trying to connect things that don't look like they will connect or bridge things that uh, uh, seem like they don't uh, belong to each other but could work together. Um, because I think solutions can be, I don't know, they can be things of beauty. And that is really what I'm after in the end. So thank you.